Hey, Sean, what you got there? Oh, I found something very special on the porch today. A little present from Amazon. A, my first copy of my book, Chapel Street. I am so happy I finally got it. My publisher copies haven't come in yet, so I ordered one myself from Amazon to take a look at it. And this is a great moment. Smells like a book, looks like a book. They spell my name right. It's, this is very exciting, you know. You don't know what it's, you know. My fellow authors know what it's like to finally get a copy of the book you've written. And um, it's, it's really cool, it's really exciting. I wanna thank everybody involved, the people at Touchpoint Press and my beta readers and my editors and you know, I want to thank my wife and I want to thank the big guy upstairs too to help make this all happen. I don't remember getting dressed. I just found myself walking down the middle of Beechwood Avenue, trailing a few steps behind Lenny. This was quite unlike our last adventure when we stayed close to the shadows out of fear of being spotted. There was no fear now. The houses lining the street were completely dark. It was very eerie, as if we were the only two people in the world. Must be late, I said. Yup, Lenny answered. It suddenly struck me that I was still speaking in my adult voice, not my unbroken ten-year-old voice. I looked ahead at Lenny. He was taller than me, physically, so I was still my ten-year-old self in this dream. As soon as the word dream entered my mind, I calmed down. This was only a dream, and dreams had their own logic. I had nothing to fear. Where are we going? I asked Lenny. The Kobayashi Maru, he said as he turned and gave me a wicked smile. The Kobayashi Maru was a Star Trek reference to an unwinnable training exercise in Starfleet Academy. I knew exactly what Lenny meant, the Coleman Pool. We opted out of hopping in it on the night of our triumph. The pool itself wasn't much, just a four-foot circular above-ground model. The problem was the location. An unclimbable seven-foot-high wooden privacy fence surrounded the entire Coleman backyard. The only entrance to the yard was a gate between the garage and the side of the house, located a few feet from the back door. That's why it was so dangerous. If you woke up the owners, you had to pass right by their back door to escape. Plus, Mr. Coleman supposedly kept a shotgun loaded with rock salt near the back door. Even the reckless Charlie balked at hopping that pool. He was the one who named it the Kobayashi Maru. Hi, I'm Paul from Trending Who, What, Where, and When. Today I will be speaking with the award-winning writer Sean Paul Murphy about his book, Chapel Street, inspired by an actual haunting. Sean Paul Murphy will be joining us from Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, my name is Sean Paul Murphy. I am a writer, a screenwriter, 14 produced motion pictures, an editor. I've edited hundreds of hours of reality television and a producer. And this is my home, Baltimore, Maryland. I was born and raised here and I've lived here all my life. I love this town. And right behind me is uh, the Baltimore's Inner Harbor. It's a Tapsco River comes right into the center of town here and it's a great place for tourists it's a great place to hang out I'd take you down there and show it to you but you know COVID my book isn't about the downtown tourist areas my book is set in the neighborhoods the old neighborhoods of East Baltimore home to the various immigrant communities these are the row houses of Baltimore where the immigrants came from the foreign lands and settled. This is the Baltimore that my ancestors came to from Bohemia. These are the alleys they walked, the streets they knew. And this is St. Wenceslas Church that used to be the heart of the Bohemian community in Baltimore. My book is very grounded in the Baltimore of old, the old Bohemian community and part of that community was centered around Chapel Street. That's where my novel gets its name. My book is also a book of cemeteries, Baltimore cemeteries. The hero is a volunteer for a genealogical service that is recording cemeteries and graves all throughout Baltimore. This is Baltimore Cemetery, 
It's one of the locations in the book. The facade is based on the Battle Abbey in England. And this is Holy Redeemer Cemetery. It's a major location in the book and a major location in my family. This is where all my ancestors who came to Baltimore from abroad are buried. One day I'll be buried here myself. It's a beautiful cemetery. Whenever you're ready, I could start. I could ask that first question about where you would take guests when they come to visit you in the Baltimore area, what your favorite spots are that people would like to see. My favorite place to take guests um, in Baltimore really depends on the guest. If they're like uh, more middle of the road, I would take them to Baltimore's Inner Harbor. It's, there's a lot of like restaurants, a lot of chain restaurants, great walking around. We got the Science Center on one side, like the Rusty Scupper, but we have a lot of restaurants in the thing called Harbor Place, which is sort of a shopping center. We also have the uh, USS Constellation, the oldest um, Navy warship still, you know, still afloat. I think, believe it's still commissioned. <laughs> and we also have a submarine called the uh, Torque there. I took my wife's father there. He wanted to be in the submarine service during the Korean War. So he was glad to be on the submarine. And we have the National Aquarium, which is a fantastic aquarium. So that's where I would take most people. Okay. Now, if you like music, if you like drinking, I would say Fells Point, which is also along the waterfront, but a little further down. And um, there's a lot of bands, a lot of small bars, some bars that have been there for hundreds of years. And uh, I'm sure the old sailors in the old days used to go there. And you now you got a lot of people playing guitars and music and having fun. There's great places to walk around, some nice restaurants, less chain oriented. Um, and between the two is a place called um, Little Italy. It's one of our few remaining ethnic neighborhoods that's like strictly an ethnic area. Baltimore, like most major cities, used to have areas where certain people would, would congregate. And Little Italy is the Italian neighborhood. I think it's mostly Italian restaurants. So um, it's a great place if you don't mind some carbs. And if you saw me standing up, you would see that I have eaten my share of carbohydrates. When you took the video that you sent us, where did you take that video? Well, I took the video, that one from the top of the hill is Federal Hill, which is across from the Inner Harbor. Okay. I think they call it Federal Hill is because um, the first bloodshed of the Civil War was actually in Baltimore as mobs attacked un uh, Massachusetts unit walking from one train station to another in order to protect the Capitol. So the federal government put a bunch of cannons on top of that hill and said they would shell the town if there was any more trouble. So that's why it's called Federal Hill. Then I guess I would ask you how you began your career in writing. Well, I always liked writing, even from like um, grade school, you know, and I, people always liked what I wrote in high school. I became a little more serious about it and actually hoped I would be able to make a career in writing. Of course, you know, how do you make a career in writing out of Baltimore? You know, it's like, it's the seventies, you know, you're not a whole lot of role models, but, um, there was, you know, except being maybe a journalist. And um, one of our neighbors across the street was a journalist. And so I knew that was possible. So I went to college and I took journalism uh, initially. And then I, um, one of our teachers brought in his success stories, you know, former um, students who became professional journalists. And we were supposed to interview him for an assignment. And I interviewed him. And when I found out how much money they were making, you know, I decided I had to leave that major. I mean, one of the guys was a professional journalist and was making more than, I was making more than him as a part-time busboy at a restaurant. So um, I took a film major and some computer classes. I never thought I would actually be in the film business, but I thought I'd end up in computers, but I ended up at an advertising agency. I wanted to be a writer there, but I ended up in production, <laughs> though I did write some commercials. Um, and eventually I just started writing screenplays and I was getting, you know, pretty nice, um, success or recognition with it when I was writing, um, my, of my first three screenplays, uh, two of them got serious Hollywood attention and eventually like my sixth screenplay got a, got me a really nice agent and around the same time as I took that agent, I turned down creative artist agencies 
at the height of their powers. Yeah. That's probably my big career mistake. Okay. You know, I, I went with a boutique literary agency rather than um, creative artist agency. Really? But I really liked the agent. He was very encouraging. And eventually, you know, he died before he sold a film of mine. And I'm, I was very sad about that. Sad for his loss, the loss of his family. Also sad that he died without taking my career into account. You know, I was just about to happen. And, you know, he died before he made it happen. But um, eventually, you know, I started making film, made my first film, a um, comedy mystery called 21 Eyes. And I had written a uh, faith-based script because I thought that would be a cool thing to do. And um, I sent that to somebody and they said, hey, would you like to write a script for us? And then I wrote like a bunch of commission scripts. Um, so I wrote, I think I have 14 produced feature films. I wrote some um, films for the FBI, true crime films that, you know, that ended up playing on the Pentagon channel that won a combined six Emmys. So, you know, I've written a... Um, number of, um, of commissioned assignments. But uh, mainly what I always wanted to write was a book, like um, my book, um, Chapel Street. Look at this, it just happened to have a copy. And uh, one thing about screenwriting is you never, whatever ends up on the film is never what you wrote. It can never be what you wrote because it has to be filtered through so many people and you write something and then they decide, well, we can't have that location. You know, what you write in the script is never going to be what you see in your head. But with a uh, book, you can do it. So um, I'm very glad I've transitioned into um, writing novels. You know, it's in many ways, it's much more satisfying. I can see that. I, I can see how that way you could say exactly what you wanted to say. It wouldn't be changed. Yeah. But the good thing about writing screenplays, particularly commission screenplays, where other people end up putting their names on it as well, is that when there's a problem with the movie and somebody says, oh, I hated that. I hated that part. You can always say, well, I didn't write that. You know, and say, oh, the movie was terrible. And you say, well, you should have saw the script. The script was great. You know, and they have no way of knowing because they'll never see the script. They only can see the movie. You know, so when you write a movie like that, you always have an excuse if it's bad. If you write a book and it's bad, it's only, only, you're only you to blame for that. Well, look, you had a lot of good reviews on the book. I, I read quite a few of them and they're all good. Well, thanks. I just got a, a great review today from a um, Instagram um, horror reviewer, um, which I was very excited about. I'll have to be putting um, info up about that before long. But um, yeah, I'm very grateful and very humbled by it. Um, you know, um, it's sort of, it's a step, it's a, it's a step into a new genre for me, but it's a genre I always wanted to write in. I've been writing horror movies, but it was my other movies that ended up getting made. So I'm very happy to um, be writing a horror film and that the fans and the reviewers specific to the genre are really embracing it. So that, that's really satisfying, you know, and, um, uh, I was hoping it would be that way, but there was no, no guarantee. <laughs> I guess you don't know when you're writing it. No, I mean, but in a case of a book like this, this was a very personal book like this. I've written movies that were product or things that were commissioned, but you know, I've written two books. Um, one was a memoir that got published and another one it was this book, Chapel Street. And um, they were both very personal books to me. And in a sense, to me, success was already achieved just by writing it, you know, find, you know, dealing with the things that made me write it and working them through in, in the context of writing a book. So, you know, I'm glad that other people like it, but, you know, to me, it was important just to get through it and put it in a way that I could get these thoughts out. Really enjoyed reading it. I was expecting it to be a little more difficult to read, but it wasn't. I just picked it up, liked it and went right through it. Well, thanks. I, I think the uh, things in um, Bohemian may have been difficult, but I only have like, one, one or two quotes. <laughs> you know, because um, you know, I really draw upon um, the community. Most of the book is um, set present day, you know, 90% of it. But I, I draw it from the roots of um, my Bohemian relatives that came to Baltimore at the uh, turn of the 20th century. And um, it's really, you know, it, the origins of what's happening in the book come from that time. And um, so I, you know, I 
tried to make it authentic to um, the period and, and that and the attitudes of the people. So then you were inspired to write this by your own personal experiences? Yeah, well, uh, let me just say what the book is for those people okay. who haven't read it. The book is called Chapel Street, and it's the story of a young man who bat, who is straddling the line between insanity, between sanity and madness while battling a demonic entity that has driven family members to suicide for generations. Now, um, why I wrote this book is, is because I grew up in a um, very actively haunted house, you know, in ba Northeast Baltimore. We family moved in in 1974. We uh, finally got rid of the house in uh, 2005, but it was extremely actively haunted. And um, I lost two of my siblings to uh, suicide. And uh, a couple years ago, my mother asked me if I thought that the entity in the house was in any way responsible in part for their deaths. And uh, Chapel Street is, a, um, is an examination of it in a fictional way. You know, I started to show it to my family members after I read it. The first one to really read it was my sister. And she, she saw, you know, a lot of the true people and true events be, you know, behind the fiction. She called it a um, cartoon version of the, re of, the, um, of the actual events. And they're highly exaggerated. But what's not exaggerated is the um, is the suicide aspect of it because not only did two of my siblings um, nearly kill themselves, I mean actually kill themselves, there were other suicide attempts, and uh, you know, there were also things I call suicide events, and these were um, supernatural incidents that had they gone to their natural progression would have resulted in a death that would have seemed like suicide. And um, I have a series of blogs. I've been in the, you know, writing this book and this, my family never talked about the haunting because we always felt, well, there were a couple of reasons. One, people would think we're crazy. Two, talking, we felt that talking about it empowered it. Three, talking about the entity will sometimes make it come to you. So another reason to avoid talk, talking about it. And so those are main, the main reasons. And um, so writing this book, dealing with it broadly in a fictional manner has given me and my family the opportunity all these years later. I mean, we moved into the house in 1974. We've only really started talking about it in a series of interviews I started last year in 2000, 2019, you know, so. Um, we're only talking about it now. And I'm learning things every time I talk to somebody, you know, things that happened, you know, like um, one of the things in the book, I don't want to give it too much away, is that the entity can mimic people. And um, I was aware of one instance where a voice was mimicked, but I didn't realize that it happened frequently with different people at the house. It never happened to me. The only thing the stuff I was really aware of was the stuff that actually happened. And to me, and this is the incident that really inspired this book was, there was um, a series of consecutive nights. I can't remember now whether it was three nights or five nights. I, my bedroom was on you know, the rear of the house in the attic. And our house, there was, our house was on the hill and there was a big drop off on the back. And there was a little roof outside of my attic for a sun, for a sun porch. But for three to five nights in a row, I woke up literally crawling out of that window, like hitting my head or my arm on the wooden um, window frame. And it was 3 a.m. every night. And that, at that point, I realized that like, it was easy to dismiss the sounds and the footsteps and things like that. But when you're waking up, and I have no history of sleepwalking, waking up, crawling out of that window, you know, had I gotten out there, it was a flat, it was a flat ceiling with a little slope. It would have been so easy to have been dead. Had I succeeded in getting out of that window, you know, I would have died. And it would have been misconstrued as a suicide. And if you read the book, our hero is dealing with, you know, he's waking up every day on the balcony of his apartment, climbing over ready to die, you know, outside, you know, through events outside of the thing, which would appear to be suicide, even though he has no conscious desire to do it. So that's what inspired me to, to main that's the main thrust of the book, 
you know, that and, well, some other issues, but that's the main action of the book, is him trying to avoid this um, supernatural, ten, you know, this tendency towards self-destruction. You know, so that's what the, essentially what brought the book to the being. And now I have to wonder, looking back, because we never even considered it, you know, with the death of my siblings. And once other siblings told me stories like the one I just told you about myself, it does make me wonder, you know. This must have been a difficult book to write. It was a, it was a very difficult um, book to write. Um, I had previously written a memoir. Look at me. Even talking subjects, I still have time to pitch. The Promise or the Pros and Cons of Talking with God. In that book, I dealt with my sister's death. Uh, you know, it, 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 my sister's death fell in directly into the narrative of my memoir, in a sense. But my brother's death, I barely brush on, you know. And if it could be said, my first book is about my sister's death, le is really leading to my sister's death. Um, Chapel Street is very much about my brother my brother's death. And um, he's easily, re anybody who reads the book who knew my brother know that the character, the lead character's brother in the book, Lenny, is based on my brother, Mark. You know, they, they have a lot of the same characteristics. And my Mark, my brother, Mark, wrestled with mental illness. And as he's discussing with his brother in this book, Lenny is discussing things with Rick. A lot of those things about his attitude towards mental illness, how to deal with it, the burden of it, are things that my brother had told me, you know, and a lot of Rick's guilt in dealing with his brother up until his brother's death is a lot of the guilt I dealt with, you know, after my own brother's death. So it's, you know, there is a lot in this book, you know, it's a very, it's a, for a fictional book, it's a very personal book. Mm -hmm. The one thing I had to be careful about though was um, the mother is nothing like my mother. You know, so every time I was telling my mother I was writing this book, she'd ask me, how's the book going? I'm coming along. I said, book's coming along, but I want to tell you, the mother is not based on you. You know, so, you know, every, how's the book coming along? It's coming along well, but the mother is not based on you. So <laughs> the mother is not based on my mother. And I was going to ask if there'd be any follow-up books to Chapel Street. Um, I could, um, I've already have in mind a prequel and a sequel. One, one before and one after. And the one before would set up what's going to set up some of the main action that would come on the sequel. And um, yeah, I, I, I could see coming back to these characters, um, you know, at least two more times, you know, and especially if it looks like we're going to get a movie. I can't say that we are, but there is some film interest in it, you know. So, you know, if, there's gonna, if it's a film and if it becomes successful, they're going to want a sequel, so I would prefer to okay. design the sequel now rather than let other people come up with it later. Even when the book was in galleys, a number of people requested to read it. So, um, there, you know, there's activity. I was going to ask you also about the, the award you won in 2012, the Kairos the Prize. The Kairos Prize. The Kairos Prize for spiritually inspirational um, screen, for, um, um, screenwriting. It's given by Movie Guide. At the time, it was a fifty thousand dollar prize. Um, now they only give fifteen thousand. It was fifty thousand, but there were three winners. So um, somebody got um, twenty five thousand. The next person got fifteen, and the next person got ten. I'm not going to tell you which one I got, but <laughs> I am. I can say I am a fifty thousand dollar a winner of the 2012 fifty thousand dollar Kairos Prize for screenwriting. I think that's the official, the official designation for it. But um, it was great. There was a big, a big um, movie guide awards in Hollywood. Um, Hallmark Channel plays the movie guide awards every year. Funny, they always cut the part about the screenwriters, you oh, know, really? the award winners. Oh. But they, they have all the other awards, but they leave out the screenwriters, you know. So, um, so I wasn't on TV, but I do have it. It's, it's a YouTube clip of. For Kairos Prize 2012, you'll be able to see um, me and the other two winners accepting our awards. I was actually second runner up. I got the uh, ten thousand dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive vice president of motion picture distribution, Walt Disney Studios, Dave Hollis.
Well, a movie has to start somewhere, and movies always start on the written page. And the talented writers who give us these great characters and stories, well, they have to start somewhere as well. That's why I'm pleased to present the Kairos Prize, which honors first-time screenwriters who create compelling entertainment that is spiritually uplifting through their screenplays. In partnership with the John Templeton Foundation, cash awards are attached to our prizes. We have prizes of 10, 15, and $25,000. So, to our winners, Second runner-up and the recipient of $10,000 tells the tale of a what if. What if John the Apostle were still around today? Congratulations to I, John, written by Sean Paul Murphy. Well, first, I want to thank God, well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't want to leave anyone out. And when I first entered this contest, I didn't know it was such a big deal and it was going to be on TV. And now I know my pastor will see it, so I guess I'm going to really have to tithe. But I want to thank everyone who's been so supportive over the years, particularly my wife. She's been with me through thick and thin, mainly thick. But um, she's been great, and I want to thank everybody else. Um, I hear the music playing, so I got to go. I'd rather write than talk, so thank you all. That was a great time. Usually when I've gone to Hollywood, particularly since I've been married, I go out alone or like I have a screenwriting partner I did a number of films with. We would go out because it was work. Mm -hmm. So my wife never really got to go out to Hollywood for, a, um, for like a function, you know, like a cool award ceremony, you know, and so... Um, they flew her out as well, so that was great. So we got to go as a couple. She got to be interviewed by um, Chinese radio, TV stations, as well as I, you know, so um, it was a lot of fun. Oh, it sounds like it, that would be a good time. Yeah, I didn't really expect I was gonna win. I didn't have a tuxedo, I had to get one really quick. Didn't wear the, um, what do you call it? There was something, I didn't, I didn't have the suspenders on and the pants kept sliding down. <laughs> So the whole time I was up on stage, I had kept one hand in my pocket to hold the pants up. This was not an award where you wanted the pants to slide down while you were receiving it. This was not the audience that would accept it. But, you know, um, Ted Bear, who runs the organization, always refers to me <laughs> as his funny winner. Because usually people up there are very serious, very, you know, spiritual. Mm -hmm. And they're not there making jokes when they win. I made a few jokes. Uh -huh. So now I'm, I'm his funny winner. So, How did you get involved with this screenwriting? It seems like this would be a, a difficult thing to get involved in in the beginning. I can see once you were in it, how it would just take off and you'd know people and they would keep introducing you. But in the very beginning, it seemed like it would be difficult. I was, um, I would say I was, on one hand, I was very lucky and I was persistent. Um, my second screenplay, I got an, eight, an agent who was actually a lawyer who sent it around. And I was getting like good reviews back from companies like um, Paramount. Now that script, which I wrote in 1989, was under option just as, as recently as um, three years ago. So the old scripts are still good, in, at least in some people's eyes. Um, another script was um, picked up by an agency that only handled directors, but they sent it around as a, um, as a package, hoping to get one of their directors to make it. And then later I got picked up by Stu Robinson at Robinson, Weintraub and Gross, which um, later merged to become part of Paradigm, which is one of the big agencies. And um, he handled me and um, he was always very encouraging and I was getting like letters, I, he would send me letters from people like Barry, Oscar winner Barry Levinson, saying Sean Murphy is a, after he, he would read one of my scripts, Sean Murphy is a very talented writer, you know, and people like Richard Zanuck, who like produced Jaws, you know, he liked my ear for dialogue. So when you're getting, you know, like rejection letters like that from people like that, it encourages you to um, 
stay in the business. Um, it took a long time before my first produced film, though. I wrote, um, between books and movies, I wrote 35 scripts before the first one was produced. I mean, 35 projects. And uh, since then, my, since then, my um, production ratio is about 70% um, production, you know, of either published or made. But um, 35. Um, John Hughes, who wrote like um, National Lampoon's Vacation and Pretty in Pink and Breakfast Club, he apparently wrote 25 scripts before, um, before um, he got the first one produced. But he's probably better than me, so I don't hold it against him. He's dead anyway. No need to be better. You would be persistent. That would be a lot of things to do without it going into and, and working for you. Well, the thing is, I got a lot of encouragement at, at very good points. And additionally, I like doing it. Okay. You know, and um, if you can't write something with no anticipation of return, maybe you shouldn't be writing. You know, if you, you should find something you can enjoy doing more. If you're not enjoying it when you're actually writing it, just stop, you know, because if you're writing it mainly to make money, you're never going to stay in it long enough to make any money, yeah. you know, so don't even consider the money or the reward, you know, in the end, you know, while Stu was alive and it was a great period, uh, you know, I, I was doing okay financially through my work as an editor, as a film editor. And I would write films just for the challenge of it. I would say like, oh, I'm going to write a mafia film, but I'm going to write one where no one gets shot until the third act. You know, and that was, and that was a very good script in my mind. But the reality is no one wants to see a mafia movie where no one gets shot until the third act. <laughs> and it's like I wrote another film, a coming of age film, and I said, I didn't want any external conflict. I wanted it to be entirely internal. And I think I pulled it off, but you know, people don't want movies that are have the where the conflict is entirely internal. So you know, a lot of my writing, I did a lot of stuff that was exercises, you know, and all those exercises improved the craft, mm -hmm. you know. So had I not done exercises like that, I may not have ended up writing fourteen produced movies. And that's just the features. Yeah. I also wrote a lot of other things that I've gotten paid for that were produced as well. What advice you would give to new writers that are beginning and trying to get started? Books is a different thing. Books is kind of harder than movies, if you ask me, because anyone can publish a book now. You know, you could self-publish. But to me, that's meaningless. Self-publishing is meaningless. Because, well, when I wrote my memoir, I had no anticipation or desire for it to be made into a movie. However, with like Chapel Street, I wanted it to be made into a movie. So, and I self-published it, the chances of being made into a movie would have gone down 95% because people don't, people in Hollywood, movie producers are not impressed by self-published books, only books that are done by publishers, you know, because everyone wants stuff to be curated. You know, no one wants to read garbage. So they always want, that's why agents are so important because like, well, he's an agent, you know, he would have weeded out the bad stuff. So even if this is bad, it's good quality bad, you know? And so for books, it's difficult because, you're up against everyone else who's self-publishing. Uh, movies, you know, are hard, in a sense, are um, fewer people are writing them, a lot are. And um, I give a lot of advice on um, how to write movies on um, my, my blog, um, seanpaulmurphyville.blogspot.com. And I, I have writing tips. I think I have like 20 something of them specifically about how to, the movie business. Some of them were more about writing and a lot of them were about, you know, how to trust people, you know, which has always been my problem being too trusting in the movie business. And, um, and my advice to anyone in the movie business is, you know, don't do anything for free. Mm, okay. You know, because um, if it's a real project, if this person's telling you they've got the money to make this movie, but they want you to write something for free, they don't have the money to make it. Okay. Because if they if they were serious, they'd have the money to pay you. So always, you know, you you know, I think the union minimum is seventy six thousand dollars now. You know, and you may not ask them if it's an independent producer and you're not in the union, you're just a normal writer. You're not going to ask this guy for seventy six thousand dollars, but you can say, yeah, I'll write it. How about ten thousand dollars up front? 
you know. And if they're thinking writing wants someone to write a, a movie that's going to cost millions of dollars to make, and they yep. can't pay you ten thousand dollars up front, you know, walk away. They're not serious about. You know, if you're serious about your craft and your writing, then, you know, you got to expect, you know, to have the equal commitment from them, which means giving you money. You know, them having the money, if they're producing something, they need the money, they need to give you some of it. And um, other than that, the main thing to do is, um, is just keep writing. You know, read all the books, go to all the movies you can. You have to, you know, if you're writing horror movies, see every horror movie. If you're writing faith-based films, see every faith-based film. If you're seeing comedies, see every comedy. There aren't many of them now anymore. You know, people are afraid to write them. You know, so, you know, if you're writing an action movie, see every action film. And keep writing. There's an excellent um, podcast for uh, screenwriting called Script Notes by Craig Mason and John August, two, like, really top Hollywood screenwriters. I always recommend that. You know, you, you know, it's a fabulous um, podcast, the best on screenwriting. And you're a teacher. Also, too, I am a, um, my wife threw in, I am a, um, I teach screenwriting at Towson University. Only one section. I'm off this semester because co enrollment is down because of COVID. You know, I did teach virtually last semester. And I think it was a better, everyone was, it was awkward a bit when we made the shift. But I think ultimately, because I felt guilty that the students weren't getting the in-class thing, I, I devoted more time to them and their work. And I think it really helped them. And I think they, be, they all became better writers as a result. You know, I think my, actually, I think my, the grades of my class, you know, together, if you look on it on an average, was higher than previous, um, previous classes. So um, I had more time to uh, give them. That'd be interesting for the students to have someone like you with that much experience teaching them that much positive yeah. experience. Well, <laughs> so that's why they brought me in. They want, um, you know, cause I'm not, I am a, I'm an alumnus, but they do want to be able to show to parents that there are people who have gone through this program mm -hmm. that actually make a living. Right. You know, who are actually out there and that it is possible. And we have another great alumnus from the program too, a guy, Mike Flanagan, who is, um, he made, um, recently did the um, sequel to a Stephen King's um, The Shining called Dr. Sleep. He directed that, wrote and directed that. And he also did The Haunting of Hill House, the um, Netflix series. And he's another Towson, um, Towson alumnus too. Oh, that's incredible. That's a big school. It's about 20,000 enrollment. Yeah, I think so. Um, maybe 25. Okay. You know, so it's a big school. There's very limited parking. Just when I started teaching, they took away the faculty parking lot closest to where my class is to build a new science building. And I'm just sitting there thinking, what are their priorities? That's you know, oh. They're making me walk just so that they could teach kids yeah. science. Well, science might become important one of these days. You never know. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Okay, and so so that schools, you're you're about sixty miles from Washington D.C. Yeah, I'd say that about sixty miles. You're you in know. a great location. Yeah, it's a uh, well, you know, I actually work most of the time in D.C. when I'm except when, except when I'm on COVID. I want to thank you for actually reading my book, you know, it, it and thank good. you for inviting me onto this. Um, I keep calling them podcasts, but this is a video cast. This is this was a, this was a great experience because a lot of times you talk to people and they, you know, and they they haven't seen the movies or read the books, so you know I'm glad you took the time to do that. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, you know, when there are so many people in the world doing so many things, you know, it's you could have there's any number of writers you could have brought on. 